Well, many of you have probably never heard of the Austrian Wilhelm Reich, but even if you've never heard of Reich, you are probably familiar with his ideas. Uh, Reich was born in 1897. He was a medical doctor and a psychoanalyst. And as a psychoanalyst, Reich was a disciple of Sigmund Freud. He actually ran an outpatient clinic that was founded by Freud. Reich wasn't just interested in psychoanalysts, though. Reich was also interested in politics. And in the late 20s and early 1930s, Reich was a committed Marxist. Now, Marxism was going through a time of crisis in the 1930s. Many of you know that the 1930s were marked by the Great Depression. During the 1930s, economy struggled. Many people were out of work, having a hard time providing for themselves. And according to Marxist theory, widespread unemployment should have sparked a Marxist revolution. But no such revolution occurred. In the United States, Marxism remained deeply unpopular. In Germany and other European states, there were small Marxist revolutions, but most quickly died. Certainly none were as successful as the Russian Revolution a decade before. Marxists thought that the Depression should have birthed all of these revolutions, but things didn't quite work out that way. So in the 1930s, Marxists did a lot of soul searching, trying to figure out why their anticipated revolutions didn't happen. And one of the Marxists who probed this question was Wilhelm Reich. He wondered why the working class refused to rebel against capitalist governments even when they were suffering so profoundly. Facing job loss, deprivation, starvation, the working classes should have been quick to take up arms against their oppressors, but they didn't. Why? Well, like many Marxists, Reich believed that the working class had what Marxists called a false consciousness. In other words, the working class had come to identify with the ruling class, even though that identification was against their best interests. White Reich wondered why the working class should have identified with the group they should have hated. And so he went about trying to figure out why the working class didn't have the animosity for their capitalist overlords that he thought they should have. And since Mike Reich, excuse me, let's try it again. Since Reich was not just a Marxist but a Freudian, it shouldn't surprise you that Reich blamed childhood for the working class's false consciousness. Most of you know Freud was big on finding the roots of adult psychosis and childhood trauma. And so Reich blamed the experiences of childhood for repressing a revolution. You see, Reich noticed that most children in Western Europe grew up in a home with a mother and father. And thus, one of the earliest lessons that children learned was to respect their mother and father. Very early on, children were taught to respect authority. And because this lesson to respect authority was inculcated from an early age, respecting authority became sacrosanct. Men and women of the working class internalized the lesson that respect for authority was a cherished value. And as a result of cherishing that respect for authority, men and women of the working class hesitated to participate in Marxist revolution. They valued authority so much that they could not bring themselves to overthrow authority even when it was in their best interest. So what prevented Marxist revolution? According to Reich, it was the nuclear family, a household structure that featured mother, father, and kids socialized the working class so they would never join in a revolution, even if, as Reich thought, it was in their best interest. So what should Marxists do to encourage revolution? Well, the answer is obvious based on Reich's conclusion. Marxists should attack the idea of the nuclear family. They should undermine the structure that saw mom and dad living together under one roof with sole authority under their children. But how do you do that? Women and men were not going to easily surrender their authority over their children. Uh, the nuclear family was an enduring institution in Western culture. What could be done to undermine the traditional family? Well, Reich said the only way to undermine the family was to attack its most treasured values. Now remember, Reich was not just a Marxist, Reich was also Freudian. What did Freud think explained all of life? The answer is sex. Freud thought that every decision a human being was made was somehow linked to sex. And Reich agreed with Freud. And so Reich believed the only way to dismantle the nuclear family was to undermine its teaching about sex. The nuclear family was based on monogamy, it was based on heterosexuality, it was based on reserving sex for marriage and on staying faithful to your spouse for life. So Reich felt that Marxists could only bring about revolution if they attacked that morality. The only way to achieve Marxist paradise is through the loosening and eliminating of sexual boundaries. So in the end, Reich believed that only unbounded, unrestricted boundaries could lead to the paradise anticipated by Marxism. Now, as I said, I doubt you've ever heard of Wilhelm Reich before, but if you are not familiar with his name, you're familiar with his ideas. 
Our culture is enamored with the idea that unrestricted morality is the key to achieving happiness and paradise. Now, I'm not saying that Wilhelm Reich is responsible for the current state of our world. I'm not saying that we can draw a straight line from Reich to a revolution that we see going on today. I don't think we say, aha, it's his fault, or aha, it's the Marxists. No, I point to Reich not because I think he is an explanation. I point to him because I think he's an illustration. William Reich voices what most people today only think. Paradise is found where the sexual boundaries are eliminated. Most people believe that personal fulfillment will be found only when sexual morals are, relate, are, are erased. And so the key to my happiness is to be able to fulfill my every desire. Our culture today teaches that paradise exists only where there are no sexual morals and no restrictions. Now, maybe you're not a fan of Wilhelm Reich, you know. Maybe my opening illustration about Marxism and Freud, that was a little too esoteric for you. So let me try another example. Have you ever heard of a guy named Bruno Mars? Now, Bruno Mars is a singer who had six number one hits on the Billboard Top 100 charts. One of those was a song named Locked Out of Heaven. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I was not familiar with the words of the song before this week, but I looked them up based on the title. And here is how Mars' songs open. If Mars' song opens. He says, Never had much faith in love or miracles. Never want to put my heart on the line. But swimming in your water is something spiritual. I'm born again every time you spend the night. Because your sex takes me to paradise. Yeah, your sex takes me to paradise. And it shows, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a pop version of Wilhelm Reich. A little less esoteric, but with a better beat. But it's exactly the same message. Transgressing boundaries is where you find paradise. You know, the woman in Mr. Mars' life doesn't stay every night, so I don't think that it's, that's his wife. One of God's boundaries is being transgressed. But the experience that Mars finds is what he describes as salvation. He says it's heaven. For Mars, transgressing the boundaries is the key to having pleasure, enjoying life, and finding fulfillment. You see, Bruno Mars puts to music the conclusion of our society. The key to our happiness is fulfilling our desires. And repressing those desires only leads to sorrow and pain. Our society says boundaries are bad things, morals are bad things, rules about sex and behavior don't protect us. Instead, they repress us. The only way our society says to find joy and happiness is to live outside the boundaries. Our society says that we should not accept the boundaries except for the ones that we place upon ourselves. Outside rules, outside commandments, they are always bad things. Boundaries keep us from being true and authentic to ourselves. And so we as a society believe that we have to throw off the boundaries. That's where paradise will be found. That's where satisfaction will be found. Well, this morning we want to examine this idea that society gives us. We want to see, are, are boundaries really barriers to happiness? Could it be that our society is wrong? Could it be that the boundaries aren't barriers to happiness, but instead are havens to happiness? Could it be that the boundaries that we think are hurting us are actually helping us? If you were with us last week, you know that we've just started a sermon series entitled Backstory. And in this series, we are looking at the backstory of the human race. You all know what a backstory is. A backstory is a previous story that explains the current one. In superhero yarns, you know, the backstory is the story that explains how the superhero got his powers. Uh, the backstory is the story that explains the superhero's psychological makeup, their strength and their hang-ups. And so like fictional superheroes, we real-life humans have a corporate or group backstory that explains where we came from and why we are the way we are. Now, the Christian version of that backstory is found in Genesis 1 through 11. In those chapters, we learn about our origins as a human race. We learn about the world that we live in and how it came to be. Genesis 1 explains who we are. Those chapters explain who God is. Those chapters help explain who we are and why we were here. Now, last week we took an opening look at Genesis 1. And really we just looked at one verse, the very first one. Last week we read Genesis 1.1 which said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so from that simple verse we learned that everything began with God. We also learned that we as humans have great value because God made us and separated us from the rest of creation. And so when God came to earth, he came in human form that humans might be adopted as his children. And so last week we learned that everything came from God and that we as humans are of great value to him. Now this week we're going to continue to dive into Genesis chapter 1. And the lesson that we are going to learn has to do with boundaries. Uh, Genesis, in some ways, Genesis 1 is an exploration of the benefits of boundaries. 
We rebel against boundaries, especially against sexual boundaries. We think that boundaries detract from our happiness. We think that boundaries stunt our development as people. But Genesis 1 gives us a different perspective on boundaries. So let's take a look at what Genesis has to say. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter so that we have it all in front of us. It's probably familiar to most of you, but follow along anyway. Maybe you can hear and uh, see some new things. And I will be reading the whole chapter. I know it's a little bit long, but hang in there. It's an interesting story, and so we'll get through it, and then we'll make some comments about what it all means. But Genesis 1, 1 through 31. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing which with the water teams and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, we know that there's also a seventh day found in chapter 2. That's where God rested and finished his creation. Lord willing, we will come to that next week. But for now, let's hang out in these six days of creation. Now, most of you already knew what Genesis 1 is about. It's about the creation of the world. And you might think that when God began creating, he began creating with a blank slate. But that's not really what this chapter tells us. Look again at verse 2. Genesis 1, 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So from verse 2, it seems that something existed before the seven days of creation in Genesis 1. 
Now, the Bible teaches that everything that exists was created by God. And so the point is not that God didn't create everything. The point is that God, at least in Genesis 1, isn't beginning with nothing. When God begins his creative work in this chapter, an earth exists, but this earth really isn't hospitable. It really isn't welcoming of life. Moses, who wrote Genesis, said the earth had two problems. One, it was formless, and two, it was empty. So at the beginning of Genesis 1, the earth is just a big blob, and the earth has nothing in it. Those are the two problems that God has to fix. And thus, Genesis 1 is all about God fixing those problems. In Genesis 1, God shapes the earth, and in Genesis 1, God fills the earth. So let's uh, take each problem one at a time. That's what the author of Genesis does. Because Moses tells us that on days 1 through 3, that God shapes the earth. Look back at the text, sort of look over those first three days of creation. What does God do on those opening days of creation? Well, on days 1 through 3, God puts boundaries on the earth. Now, verse 4 tells us what God did on day 1. He separated the light from the darkness. He put a boundary between the two, and he said that it was good. Verse 6 tells us what God did on day 2. He separated the waters above from the waters below. Now let me explain that one because that's a little odd to us. Genesis seems to teach that the earth as originally formed had a ring of water above the atmosphere. So God separated the water above the earth from the water that remained on the earth. Now you might say, well, we don't have a water ring around the earth today. Why? Well, Moses tells us that the water was released to flood the earth in the day of Noah, so it's not there anymore. We'll come to that in Genesis 6, where it rolls. But in the beginning, there apparently was water above the earth and water on the earth. So on day two, God put a boundary between the waters above and the waters below, and it was good. Verse 9 tells us what God did on day three. On day three, God separated the water from the dry land so that the ocean and river stayed in their boundaries. Day three is sort of all about flood prevention, and it was good. So days 1 through 3 address the first problem of the earth is found in Genesis 1-2. On days 1 through 3, the earth is given form or shape. Days 1 through 3 are all about boundary installation. Boundaries are installed to make the earth habitable and safe. And each day a boundary is installed, it is declared good. So the first lesson of Genesis 1 is that boundaries are good things. Now as I said before, we we tend not to think of boundaries as good things. We tend to think of boundaries as restrictive and as repressive. We don't think of boundaries as good or as useful. Remember that old cowboy song they used to sing, Don't Fence Me In, right? That's our attitude towards boundaries. But boundaries don't have to be good, be bad. Let me give you an example of a time where boundaries could be good. We have two dogs at home, Raven and Oliver, and Raven is very good off leash. Most of the time I can control her with my voice. I trust Raven to come when needed. Oliver is not so good off leash. I don't trust him to listen to my voice commands. And as a result of that, Oliver wishes that we had boundaries. You see, Oliver loves to run. He wants to go outside and run in the backyard just like his big sister. But we can't let him out to run. Why? Because our backyard is not completely fenced. Now, we do have a fence around our yard over there, but that fence is broken down. It has some big holes. And so if we let Oliver run, he probably wouldn't stop running. You know, he'd be in the woods and out on Gemini Road, and then boom, he'd be gone. In Oliver's case, something interesting is happening. In Oliver's case, the lack of boundaries are actually restricting his freedom. Oliver doesn't have the ability to fulfill his desires because there aren't boundaries to keep him safe. You see, boundaries would be good for Oliver. Boundaries would allow Oliver to enjoy life and to flourish as a dog. So in spite of what we think, boundaries can actually be good things. They can allow us to flourish and enjoy life while keeping us safe. So with that potential goodness of boundaries in mind, let's head back to Genesis chapter 1. On days 1 through 3, God fixed the problem of a shapeless earth, and that leaves one problem to be fixed, the problem of an empty earth. And God fixes that problem on the next three days, right? On days 4 through 6, God fixes that problem of an uh, uh, empty earth, filling it with good things. The filling of the earth actually starts on day 3, right? Verses 11 through 13 tell us that when God separated the land from the sea, he filled the land with vegetation and trees. Then on day 4, verses 14 through 19, tell us that God filled the sky with the sun, the moon, and the stars. The filling of the sky continued on day 5. In verses 20 through 23, we read that God filled the sky with birds. On the same day, God filled the ocean with fish and other living creatures. And finally, on day six, God continued to fill the land. Now there were not only plants, God also introduced living creatures, reptiles and amphibians, 
and animals. And on all of these days, all that God did was good. And so day four through six tell us that after God created the boundaries, he filled those boundaries with good things. And he didn't just fill those boundaries. I mean, he jam-packed those boundaries with good stuff. Think about the variety of life on our planet. Think about all the species. God just kept stuffing good things into the boundaries on days four through six. So on days one through three, God created boundaries in the earth. And on days four through six, God filled those boundaries with good things. So what is the lesson of Genesis 1? The lesson of Genesis 1 is that God's boundaries are where we experience God's blessings. Let me say that again. You know what this is? God's boundaries are where we experience God's blessing. Now note something here. Note that the message of Genesis 1 is the exact opposite message that we get from our society. Our society says the boundaries, particularly sexual boundaries, are a source of frustration, alienation, and unhappiness. But God says that freedom and joy are found in the boundaries that God has established. And it's this conviction about God's boundaries that leads to Christian sexual morality. The conviction that blessing is in the boundary leads Christians to claim that the best context for enjoying the gift of sex is in the boundaries of marriage between a man and a woman. Christians see boundaries as a blessing not a curse because of the backstory that we believe. Right? Last week in Genesis 1.1, we said that we believe that God created the world. And today, Genesis 1 continues the rest of the story. Genesis 1 tells us that without God's creative activity, this world would have been a horrible place. It would have been an inhospitable and uninhabitable place. But God shaped the world. He placed the world, he placed the blessing in the boundaries. And having created those boundaries, again, they were just filled with blessings. And so, as Christians, we do believe that boundaries, we do not believe, excuse me, the boundaries and moralities are systems of oppression and repression. Instead, we believe that God's boundaries are systems of blessing and flourishing. God gave us sexual morals for the purpose of freedom and flourishing, not suppression and repression. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, like, I see the point about boundaries, but I don't understand why you're talking about these boundaries and blessings in relation to sex. I mean, so far we've been talking about skies and oceans and about birds and fish. I haven't seen anything about the birds and the bees. Why are you focusing so much on that type of boundary when you talk about boundaries here? But one of the reasons I'm focusing on those boundaries is those are the primary boundaries our society wishes to erase. Now think of Wilhelm Reich. Our society's assault on God's boundaries is most obvious in the area of sexual behavior. But my focus on those boundaries also comes from Genesis 1 itself. You see, God didn't just put lizards and amphibians and animals on the earth in day six. He also put man and woman. We looked at that last week. Do you remember what we read? Genesis 1.27, Moses writes, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Moses told us that men and women were the highlight of God's filling of the boundaries. But this is not all that Moses tells us about the creation of men and women. We learn more about this part of the story in Genesis chapter 2. Now we're going to look at Genesis 2 in another week or two, Lord willing. But let's get a little preview of the story now. I know we all hate spoilers. You know, we don't like to spoil what's coming next. But let's do it anyway. Turn to Genesis 2 and let's read from the second part of verse 20 to verse 24. Look at Genesis 2, 20. Moses writes, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now let's stop there just for a second. I know we only read one verse and already we have to stop. But we need to set some context. Chapter 2 describes the creation of men and women a little differently than chapter 1. In chapter 2, we learn that men and women were not created at the exact same moment. For Genesis chapter 1, you might have thought that Adam and Eve appeared on the earth at the exact same second. Genesis 1 tells, excuse me, Genesis 2 tells us that Adam was created. He was given a chance to name some animals. And as Adam named the animals, you know, he realized he liked the animals. But Adam also realized that none of the animals was designed to be his deepest, most intimate companion. And so when verse 20 tells us that no suitable companion was found for Adam, it means that Adam realized he was never going to have a deep relationship like with a porcupine or a goat. Okay? So let's continue. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, 
for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So as we said, these verses further explain the creation of men and women. And in these verses, God does exactly what he did during the first three days of creation. In these verses, God creates boundaries. We've seen the boundaries that God created on the first three days of creation. God separated light and darkness. He separated upper and lower water. He separated land and sea. And again, God sets up boundaries. Now, what are the boundaries that God sets up? Well, first he sets up the boundary of men and women separating the two genders. Now, this is found in Adam's words that his new friend will be called woman. And that boundary is actually also found back in the Genesis 1 account when we're told that God created the male and female. The boundary of a gender is a part of what God makes here. But gender isn't the only boundary set up with the creation of Eve. In Genesis 2, God also sets up the boundary of marriage and family. Right In Genesis 2, God initiates marriage. God says that a man and woman should leave their parents and unite together. And those words created a boundary of sorts. A parent and children constitute a family. However, when the son of one family marries the daughter of a second family, a third family is created. A new boundary is formed. And so once again, as in Genesis 1, God is creating good boundaries. And once again, as in Genesis 1, we understand that God pours his blessing into the boundaries. You see, Genesis 2, 23 makes it clear that the boundaries of chapter 2 are also filled with blessing. Verse 23 says it's within the boundary of marriage that a man and woman experience the blessing of sex. Most of you know the phrase, become one flesh, and verse 23 is a euphemism for sex. And so the message of Genesis 2, 23 is clear. The blessing of sex is to be created, created to be experienced in a certain boundary. The boundary of one woman with one man inside a marriage. And so the boundaries of Genesis 1 and 2 are explicitly connected to the boundaries of sexual morality. And these lessons were very important for Genesis' first audience. You see, as humans, we all have a backstory. But the book of Genesis itself also has a backstory. We've mentioned that the book of Genesis was written by Moses. And that's not just speculation. Jesus confirms that in the Gospels. And we presume that Moses learned the story of Genesis when he met with God on Mount Sinai. Now, you remember how the story of Moses goes. Though Moses was the son of Jewish slaves, he was raised in the house of Pharaoh, the Egyptian ruler. And at 40 years old, Moses lost his status as the king's son and was driven out of Egypt into exile. However, at 80, Moses was called by God to return to Egypt and to lead the people of Israel from slavery to a promised land where they could live freely and serve and worship God. And so by God's power, as experienced through ten plagues, Moses was successful in liberating Israel and leading her out of bondage to Egypt. And so Israel headed out of Egypt into the wilderness on a journey to the promised land. And at Mount Sinai, God made a covenant with Israel. There Moses spent 40 days on the mountain meeting with God and receiving the Ten Commandments. So Genesis was given to Moses when Israel received the law as they were headed to the promised land. Now, settling in that promised land would be a real challenge for Israel. First, there were hostile nations in the promised land that were not exactly going to welcome, roll out the welcome mat to this new people. But second, the nations of the promised land did not live by God's law. The nations in the promised land did not agree that God's law was the best way. And so Israel would soon be living among people who did not agree with God's boundaries. And in particular, the Canaanite people did not agree with God's sexual boundaries. Read through the rest of Israel's journey to the promised land. Read through the early history of Israel in the promised land in the book of Joshua and Judges. And you will see that the inhabitants of the promised land had few boundaries. They engaged in all sorts of practices that the law forbade. And so Genesis 1 was a timely lesson for the people of Israel. God wanted them to know that he had designed the world so that boundaries would be a place of his blessing. Living among a pagan people who had no respect for God's law, the people of Israel needed to know that blessing would not be found outside the boundaries. And so law-breaking was not the key to personal fulfillment. Joy was found only in the blessing that God filled the boundaries with. And just like the people of Israel, we need the lesson of Genesis 1. We need to know that God's boundaries are where one experiences God's blessings. And we need to know that the greatest manifestation of that truth is found in the blessing of sex inside the boundary of marriage. Those boundaries built by God are not meant to be repressive. They're not meant to be oppressive. 
They're not meant to be patriarchal or misogynistic. They're not meant to harm or to hurt. Instead, God who created us gave us those boundaries so that we could flourish and know his greatest blessing. God intended the blessing of sex for the boundary of male-female marriage. He intended this for our good, for our flourishing, not our harm. Now, someone might object here. Someone might say, well, I know a lot of marriages that aren't very good. I know a lot of people that are living in the boundary that aren't getting the blessing. You know, they fight, there's no intimacy, they're cold and distant. Based on experience, it doesn't seem like the blessings are all that, boundaries, excuse me, are all that blessed. And that is very true. There are people living in the boundaries that aren't knowing a lot of blessings. And for that part of the story, you have to go to Genesis 3. We're going to get there in a few weeks, Lord willing. But most of you know the story of Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, the first couple, didn't obey God. They ate from a tree that God said not to eat from. And when Adam and Eve did that, the world fell. Death entered the world. Hate entered the world. Men and women suffered separation in their relationships. Men and women were separated from God. And after Genesis 3, we don't see the full blessing that was intended because the boundaries were breached. We breached the boundaries and some of the blessing leaked out. And so in an imperfect world, not everything is as God intended. But the imperfection of our world does not change the truth of the way we were created. The imperfection of our world does not erase the validity of God's promises. Despite the fall, God's boundaries are still where we experience God's blessing. And so that truth is diminished by sin, but it is not erased. Now, you know, our society indoctrinates as well. Our society has told us a different story than Genesis. And so we want to challenge the Bible's lessons here. We want to hold on to a cultural story that says break the boundaries. But I think even as we try to hold on to our culture story, we have a nagging suspicion that the lesson of the Bible is actually true. Because the lies our culture tells us about sex cannot be sustained. Now, if you've chosen to ignore God's boundaries, chances are very good that you are not in paradise. Now, like Bruno Mars, you might have had some moments of heaven. But that's not where the adventure ends in the long run. Even on earth, there are less than heavenly results for breaking the boundaries. Now, in August 2018, the New York Times reported that the U.S. had a whopping 2.3 million new STD infections. That was an all-time high. And that's not the only danger. What's another outcome of our casual sex culture? Some women's groups report that 11.2% of women will experience some type of assault while they are in their early 20s there would be less opportunity for that in a culture that bounded sex and marriage. And the toll of breaking boundaries isn't just physical. In 2013, a Psychology Today article reported that a great majority of college students report feeling depressed, regretful, and uncomfortable after sexual encounters with someone other than their spouse. Now, Psychology Today, folks, that's not a Christian publication. And the publication warned uh, its college students that though they were free to have sex with anyone they wanted, they should consider the emotional cost of random hookups. None of that sounds like heaven. What our culture teaches doesn't match experience, but God's truth does. The blessing is in the boundaries. So what's the takeaway from today? What do we do with the lesson that we've had this morning? Well, the first thing we do is we thank God for his grace. Because I'm sure the sermon was painful for some of us. Some of us can remember times when we have transgressed the boundaries. And as we recall that experience, we know that God's blessing was not experienced outside of his boundaries. And it might have felt good for a while, but the feeling didn't last. And so we all know firsthand the pain and the shame of not following God's way and God's truth. And so if you've had that experience of transgressing the boundaries, I am not trying to add to your pain. Because if you are a Christian, those experiences no longer define you. You don't need to have pain or guilt or shame this morning. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And so the point today is not to make anyone feel guilty about the past. If you have confessed your sin and turned to Jesus, then those past experiences are dead and buried. They have no power to act in your world because those things are gone and you are somebody new. God has freed you from your past. He has given you a clean heart. Because honestly, not too many of us can say that we got 100% on the sexual morality exam. And so thank God he paid the price for us and freed us from our guilt and our shame. So you can thank God for his grace. And if you haven't received God's grace, you can do that through Jesus. You can confess your sin, trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, and then receive the Holy Spirit to help change your heart. And then you can start honoring God's boundaries. Because this sermon today really isn't so much about the past, it's more about the future. The sermon is a lot more about where we go from here. 
See, many of us have believed the lie that says joy and paradise are found when we get rid of the boundaries. But our Genesis backstory invites us to imagine life in a different way. So by the power of God's Holy Spirit, we would do well to follow God's plan of sex remaining inside the boundary of marriage. And if you've been experiencing it in any other way, then it is time to run. It is time to flee. It is time to confess. It is time to pray that God would change you by the power of his Holy Spirit through the work of Jesus. The Apostle Paul gave us this advice about sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. He wrote, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Paul said, flee from sexual immorality. Run from it like you run from a fire. But you know what? It's not just enough to run away from something. You also have to have something to run to. If you try to run away from this in your own strength, it's just going to become a round trip. You're going to go right back where you started. You need a destination to flee to, and that destination is Jesus. The way to free your heart from the love of improper relationships is to find joy in a relationship with Jesus. You see, often we mistake sex for love, but sex isn't love. The purest love that we can find comes from Jesus. He gave himself for us so that we could have a relationship with him. And to escape any type of sin, whatever sin, maybe you're not dealing with this sin, any sin that you might be wrestling with, to escape any type of sin, you have to love something more than the sin itself. And when we cultivate a love for Jesus, we diminish the pull of sin. And so if you're struggling with obedience here, you need to get another Christian involved. You need to find somebody to hold you accountable. Men find a man, women find a woman. And then start letting that other person ask you the tough questions. Use them as a resource when temptation strikes. If you've gotten stuck into boundary breaking, it can be very hard to come out on your own. You need God to change your heart so that you love him more than sex. And you need another person who's going to hold you accountable for the choices that you make. Yeah, I started our sermon with Wilhelm Reich, the man who thought the world would achieve Marxist paradise when he threw off the sexual boundaries of Christianity and the Western world. Well, Reich didn't just preach that, he lived it. While Reich was married, he engaged in a series of affair, affairs that ultimately led to divorce. And in addition, Reich began to pick up all sorts of proclivities that can't be spoken of publicly. And in the end, after another failed marriage and multiple other affairs, Reich actually died in an American prison. Many of Reich's colleagues believe that he had gone insane in his later years. This insanity led Reich to promote all this sort of medical quackery that landed him in jail. And Reich's latter years were decidedly unhappy. Reich spent his whole life transgressing the boundaries and found nothing but hell on earth for most of his years. Heaven is not found in transgressing the boundaries. The boundaries were what characterized the first paradise of the Garden of Eden. So don't buy the lie. The boundaries give us the freedom to be the people that God created us to be. The goodness of proper boundaries is the moral of the human backstory. The blessing is always found in the boundaries. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we do come to you this morning, and we certainly confess that we have not always done a good job of staying within the boundaries. Father, there are times that we certainly wandered from this teaching to our own harm, to our own hurt, but we do thank you for the grace that is found in Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness we have. We thank you that the guilt of these things has been removed from us, that in Jesus we have become new people. And Father, we thank you for the heart that Jesus has to help sinners. Father, Jesus came to save, not to condemn. And Jesus wants to see us released from this slavery that we live into to these types of sin. And so, Father, if for anyone who is struggling with this today, I just pray that they would know Jesus' heart for them, that they would know Jesus' love, and that they would find the love of Jesus far more satisfying than these things that the culture gives to us. Help us in your power and strength to be the people that you created us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.